uh, Felix Lopez. He is an engineer at uh, engineer manager at Eventbrite. Um, he is quarantined currently in Salamanca, if I'm not mistaken, in Spain, which That's is right. where you want to learn Spanish if you want to speak Spanish like a true uh, pro. That's what they say <laughs> here in Spain. Um, but aside from uh, speaking excellent Spanish, um, uh, Felix is a seasoned manager with over 17 years of experience and large and mid-sized organizations and startups. And he's also a tattoo lover. So that's a fun fact for you. Um, Felix is going to give us a talk today. So please send your questions to the chat and feel free to also voice them out at the end of his talk. Whenever you're ready, Felix. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I've worked in several startups, scale ups, big corporations like Google, now even Bright. And today, the idea is to tell you what I believe is the secret ingredient to have high performing teams. This is something that we can actually see in most early stage startups people he, with huge commitment, eager to contribute, help, and who cares a lot about the product they're building. But this starts to get complicated as the company grows. This ingredient is ownership, something that helps teams to thrive in ambiguity, help them navigate uncertainty, and create commitment. And I'm going to start explaining what a lot of people believe is ownership, but is not. Because there is a lot of hype uh, lately around it. Uh, there is a lot of people and blog posts talking about this. And everyone wants to have it as it was as easy as to say the word. And too many companies think that having um, ownership is as simple as having cross-functional teams. For those who don't know them, the idea behind these teams is that they are self-sufficient. They go from idea to production. Each team has every role it needs. Designer, backend, frontend, in some cases, SREs. In other teams, there is a platform team that provides the tools to deploy or monitor. Um, the idea behind these teams is to reduce as many dependencies as possible reducing coordination outside of the team. If you are lucky, each team will have a PM too. Also, each team normally have the skills it needs. It, it, sorry, it needs. So this means that in a state of a front end, some teams can have a mobile engineer. And what do these teams try to, to avoid? The traditional way of work in a lot of companies. That's what you can see in the slide, where someone from management, usually the CEO, has an idea or establish the strategy, product, product works, develops and creates the idea, design creates the interface, the interface of the design, and the engineering team implements the functionality. Keep in mind that in all these steps, there is a feedback loop between the two, uh, management and product, product and design, etc. In these teams, the time until you're able to be in production is spent in useless and repetitive meetings. Most of the questions that design had, product had them too, and engineering had them too. And it takes weeks to validate an idea and sometimes to realize that it wasn't feasible at all. Also, this creates knowledge silos. And all the process is sequential and follows some specific order. So we can't do things in parallel. Another problem with this way of work is that communication is inefficient because you always have middlemen. These teams just execute. So you are hiring the best talent, or at least you think you are hiring the best talent in the world, and you don't allow them to give their opinion or to speak. It, for me, it's madness. And as you can imagine, these teams don't have purpose. And who do you think is going to be more, to be more productive? A team with purpose or a, or a team without it? They don't have any autonomy either. The only one with autonomy is management. The rest, the other teams, are told what to do. Also, as the cycle is so long, testing a hypothesis and iterate over the product will be very difficult. And on top of that, Product doesn't have any visibility on what engineering is doing. They normally find out in presentations every two weeks. And this creates the feeling that there are different groups, like uh, they weren't working in the, same, in the same goal. And all of these problems are solved by, by cross-functional teams. The question is, does this create ownership? No. As I said, solve a lot of problems, but this, this is not exactly what ownership means. It's, ownership is more than that. And the same goes for the well-known OKRs. Many companies think that it's just a framework to define and track goals. But apart from that, the company works as always. They don't change a thing. They just use OKRs where they used to use goals. And in my opinion, you don't become a knight because someone tells you you are or because you celebrate the ceremony. 
you go through a ceremony because you became a knight long ago. And th this is exactly what happens with OKRs. Um, the question is, why are these, teams, are these teams better? Why are they more effective, efficient sorry, and more productive? Is having OKRs and confusional teams uh, all together? No, they are good practices and they help a lot. But I work in teams that were extremely good and they didn't have any idea of what OKRs or cross-functional teams were. What really makes committed and motivated people and therefore much more productive is the ownership that comes from autonomy and purpose. It's a culture shift. OKRs and cross-functional teams are great tools, but not enough by themselves. For example, the company can establish the strategy using OKRs and then each team, usually the PN, uh, define how these OKRs apply in her area. This is no one, at least usually, no one tells her what to do. And they also have the autonomy to decide how to do it. Let's imagine Uber or Cabify here in Spain. They can have an OKR to reduce the cost of each trip. Then the driver's team can contribute to that OKR improving the algorithm that creates the routes. The pricing team can contribute to uh, improving the algorithm that calculates the, the, the price, taking into account the current demand, and et cetera, for other teams. And once they decide what to do, they also decide how to do it. And this is a real example of what ownership means. And sorry, but ownership is not equity either. There are a lot of companies that think that this is the way, but in reality, this is much, much more com complex. Humans are more complicated than this. Fun fact, the equity that we know was born as an attempt to improve employee motivation and engagement, an attempt to increase productivity. A new law or new le or legislation was approved in the 70s in the United States to give employees a piece of the pie with the hope to have more motivated employees. The problem is that there have been several studies after that that say otherwise. This is, this is not clear that equity is beneficial or even harmful. But what we know for sure is that the feeling of ownership, the psychological ownership, is more important, than, um, more important to predict attitudes, behaviors, and performance than equity. In a few words, if you want motivated people, uh, the feeling of ownership is more important than equity. So what's ownership and why is important? Well, basically, it's important because it fosters some of our fundamental needs. The first one is self-efficacy. It's our belief in our own abilities to deal with different situations. Self-efficacy relates to people believe, people's belief that they can successfully implement an action and be successful with a, sorry, with a specific task. It's like saying something like, uh, I need to do this task, I can do it, and I therefore own the responsibility for achieving success. When you have a strong sense of self-efficacy, what you're going to find or you're going to have is people that view challenging problems as tasks to be mastered, develop a deeper interest in the activities in which they participate, form a stronger sense of commitment to their interests and activities, and recover quickly from setbacks and disappointments. And if you have a weak sense of self-efficacy, it's the other way around. You avoid challenging tasks, uh, believe that difficult tasks are, and situations are beyond your capabilities. This is called or known as fixed mindset. And you focus on personal failings and negative outcomes. And also you quickly, uh, quickly lose confidence in personal abilities. The following one is self-identity, that it represents our ideas of what we might become, what we would like to become, and what we are afraid of becoming, which function as incentives for certain behavior. That's it. Our behaviors will go in the direction of who we want to be. We do things because of what we are, and because by doing them, we establish an affinity and identity of ourselves. When you don't have, sorry, when you have actually an external sense of self-identity, you have better well-being. This provides a person with a social environment to which they belong. It's a source of self-esteem. Um, function also as incentives to for certain behaviors, as I mentioned before. And when you have a weak sense of self-identity, you have people that are dissatisfied in, uh, by their job. There is lack of confidence, decreased motivation, performance, and therefore the people normally quit these companies. And the next one is the belonging, that is the human emotional need to be accepted um, uh, in a group or for part of a group, whether it's a family, friends, co-worker, a religion, whatever. Uh, People tend to have an inherent uh, desire to be uh, part of something and to be an important part of something greater than themselves. When you have a strong sense of belonging, what happens is that you have uh, is a source of self-esteem because happiness at against stress. Actually, this is um, also at against um, depression. 
uh, and a threat perform and a motivation. And it's very, very similar to self-identity. You don't have um, this sense or you have a weak sense of, of uh, belonging, you normally are dissatisfied by the job. There is lack of confidence, decreased motivation, decreased your performance. Um, basically, you don't find your place in the, in, at work. Okay? okay, so we know the benefits of psychological ownership. As we've seen, it keeps people motivated, view challenging problems as tasks to be mastered, increase self-esteem, performance. But what's ownership and how can we get it? TLDR, it's what happens when you have the right environment. We don't have ownership just because we want to. In the same way, you can demand someone to be creative. These things come with the right environment. Ownership for me is when people step up when there is a problem instead of saying, uh, this is not my responsibility. People that go beyond the responsibilities, they care about the product and, and try to improve things, even if they're not part of the responsibilities. Therefore, ownership is not just a, a set of responsibilities. You can have people that fulfill them, but nothing else. This is the classic behavior of that's not my problem, I've done my part. These are, there are also quite a few studies that tell us that people are more productive and there is less attrition when there is this kind of ownership. When you only have responsibilities and there is no commitment nor ownership, it's much more difficult for people to propose horizontal initiatives in the company. Also innovating in things that are not strictly the responsibility or to try to promote changes, to, to, to change the, stat, the status quo especially with the effort and energy that these things takes in, in most companies. So how can we create this environment? Until quite recently, the way to motivate people was using extrinsic motivations. These motivations are, for example, money or equity. The problem with them is that when you use them, the only way to keep motivating people is to increase them. And the worst, the worst part is that due to the hedonic adaptation, people quickly return to a, return to a relatively a stable level of happiness or in other words your expectations grow linearly with your salary therefore we always want more and we are always dissatisfied there are there are several studies about the relationship between extrinsic motivation and satisfaction but there is one that i really really like that is a meta, a meta analysis where the authors review 120 years of research and the data set include 15,000 individuals and the results tell us that the association between salary and job, and job satisfaction, sorry, satisfaction is very, very weak. Also, keep in mind that in a world, this, the tech industry, where the, there is almost zero unemployment, competing for talent with money is not possible. There, is, there, there, there will always be someone that is going to pay more than you. Also, uh, we know that there, there is a link between extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivations. When we use extrinsic motivations too much, well, we automatically reduce the other ones. For example, enjoyment, fear of curiosity, learning, personal uh, challenge. And on top of that, we know that intrinsic motivations are better predictors for performance. So if we want um, committed and motivated people, money is not the solution, or at least it's not the only one. Okay, then what? What we can do? Do you know Daniel Pink? He's the author of one of the best books about motivation. Uh, he's called also the father of the motivation uh, 3.0. I really hate that name, but that's how they call it. Um, and what he tells us is that in order to, to create intrinsic motivations, we need three things. First, autonomy. That is the need to direct uh, your own life and work. To be fully motivated, you must be able to control what you do, when you do it, and who you do it with. Apply to things, the ideal situation is one in which you have the autonomy to decide your own priorities within the strategy of the company. For this, you can use, for example, OKRs, and also the autonomy to decide how to do them. The other one is purpose. That is the belief that we work on something important greater than us. For example, having a good uh, impact on others, our customers. People become disengaged and demotivated at work if they don't understand uh, uh, or can invest in the big picture. And mastery is the ability to do our work, the desire to improve. If you are motivated by mastery, by mastery, you'll likely see your potential as being unlimited. And you're constantly seeking to improve your skills through learning and practice. And when you have this, is when you can have real ownership. An environment where people feel responsible um, for the, the, their part of the product. And for the, 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 they're also responsible that the product works and signs. 
Okay, so we define autonomy as the need to direct your own life and work, but there is another way of defining autonomy as authority. This is, you give people the authority on something and that's a catalyst for accountability. You're giving freedom and autonomy and that implies that you're giving responsibility. For example, if a team is responsible for a service not going down or is responsible for a part of the product, the sign up, the onboarding or whatever, they need the authority, the autonomy to make decisions within the area for which they are responsible. And this, this works the other way around too. When you empower your team, giving them autonomy to make decisions, automatically the team is responsible for the execution. A service good not going down, better conversion in the sign up or whatever. In short, we're trying to change the behavior of this is not my responsibility. And something that I always mention, because this is not part of what uh, Daniel, uh, men, the, the Daniel Pink mentions, but I think it's really important, is that trust is also part of, the, of what ownership means. If you give autonomy, it's because you really are willing to trust people. Otherwise, giving autonomy is more harmful than beneficial. What I mean by this is that we can't give autonomy and then micromanage people or add like blockers. I'm not saying that we shouldn't check how things are going or we can or we shouldn't, uh, sorry, we can and we should, uh, but we need to learn how to delegate properly. Trust have a huge impact on how committed an employee is, in having a team aligned, in how you delegate, and it's a driver for innovation, for conflict resolution, foster collaboration, break, break silos, better and more open communication, learning from mistakes. When there is no trust, uh, people are more shy, introvert, indifferent. People don't speak up, don't dare to say what doesn't work, doesn't question the status quo. They're afraid of collaboration. There is no feedback. And it works both ways. When you lose trust in the, in the company, you also lose confidence in yourself. And this affects our, uh, affects our commitment with the company. This is when we start wondering, what am I doing in this company? I always like to, to, to mention this. This is the uh, three dimension of trust, the dimensions of trust, the three C's. And it's a um, series of behaviors that we want to see in people, in teams, and that managers, uh, as a managers, we should foster in people. The first one is trust of character that sets the tone and direction of the teamwork. This dimension of trust represents mutually serving, inten serving intentions and is the starting point of a team relationship. When teams have trust of character, each member has faith that the others will behave as expected. Team members care about one another as people and hold each other's best interests in mind. In mind. Team members build this trust when they do what they say they will do, but also when they, they say that they can do something, okay? Um, trust of communication fuels collaboration I make it safe uh, for team members to talk with, uh, with each other directly, not only to provide information to one another, but also to work through issues and concerns and offer feedback in the spirit of deeper learning and growth. Through trust of communication, teams practice transparency. They communicate openly, openly and honestly. Members feel safe to admit mistakes, uh, know where they stand with one another. Um, trust of communication also creates an environment of collaborations that teams need to thrive. This is what it calls uh, psychological safety, uh, that if we have time later, we can talk about it uh, a little bit more. And the last one is trust of capability, that opens the door um, for team members to contribute, to use their knowledge to make the, a difference. Members um, build this type of, of trust by leveraging the skills and abilities of one another seeking each other's input, engaging in decision making, and teaching um, new skills to, to other members. Trust of capability enables the innovation teams need to be competitive. And as I said before, with purpose, people became disengaged and demotivated uh, at work if they don't understand the bigger picture. When people think, uh, feel that they are working on something greater, they're more, more committed, more productive. And this happens when the company and team vision are clear to everyone. This is super helpful and helps to solve a lot of problems and uncertainties of every day. It helps to prioritize. Should we do this or, or, or that? Well, start thinking which of these things are more aligned with the vision of the, of the company and the values of the company and then you have the answer. So this guides us when we have to make the goals uh, and prioritize. Uh, this is, is the light at the end of the tunnel. It gives us direction and helps us everyone to be aligned. 
this is even more important when companies are growing. At the beginning, it's really, really easy to understand the vision of the company and how you contribute to it. But as the company grows and people start working on more specific teams, it's really difficult. So how can you do it? You need to help um, every member link and feel uh, identified with the company goals. For example, using OKRs and helping them um, with the professional career inside the company. But also with things like feeling identified with the company values. For example, being carbon free and there are probably a lot of people that are going to feel identified by that. That's the reason why it's so important to set a clear vision for the company and to have a very strong culture. And here is super important leadership, the managers, CTOs, CEOs, etc. They have to evangelize about the vision, the values, and the direct manager has a clear responsibility um, keeping people motivated and feeling that the word is important. For example, there will always be uh, tasks that are boring, tasks that with no technical challenge, but they're still super important and someone, someone has to do them. So it's vital that the manager reiterate the value to, to the team. And the last thing is that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, that, um, mastery is the ability to do our work, but there is no point in having autonomy and purpose if, uh, if we don't have any idea of how to do our work. And here managers have a clear responsibility. Too many times I've been told, sure, if you have a top performer, top performers, it's super easy to manage that team. But how do you do it when you have normal people? The reality is that that's precisely where a good manager sign. You have to develop, grow your people. It's almost impossible to hire only top performing people. Normally, you have a bit of everything and your job is to help them to achieve that level. You have to identify the gaps between people uh, that the people have right now with their current role, but also you have to identify the, the gaps with the next role so that they, they can achieve the, the level that you, you or the standards that, that, that you want. How do you do that? I don't know if you know this, this is called the learning cycle. And basically these are the four steps that everyone uh, goes through when you are doing something new, a new skill, for example. So basically what happens is that when you start a new, a new skill, you, we, we want to see it this way too. This is like the, the moral, the, the moral that we have, okay? So when you are starting something, your moral is super high because you don't know that what you don't know. You are an unconscious incompetent. But as soon as you start realizing what you have in front of you, your moral goes down because you, you start thinking and seeing how complex it is what you have to do. And w once you start um, being better at, at that uh, skill, you start to, to become um, um, conscious competent. And when you are super good, you are uh, an unconscious competent. So here the manager has to realize in which phase is each member. And depending on that, it has to change the way of, of, of um, manage people. This is one of the things, for example, this is called um, servant leader. And basically you have to adapt to every to everyone. So for example, in the unconscious incompetent, you have to, to, to do a, your role is to be a mentor. You have to instruct people. You have to tell them not, not exactly what to do, but pretty close to that. When you are in the, in the conscious um, incompetence, what you have to do is to, to do coaching. You have to guide people. You have to ask questions so that they can, they can understand better and they can um, learn by themselves. And when they are um, conscious um, competence, what you have to, to, to do is to give them more tasks and more responsibilities so that they can expand their knowledge. And the last one that a lot of people think that this is super easy because that people that they, they, they know exactly what they're doing. The problem with this is that sometimes you, these people are going to be bored uh, because of that. And what you have to, to give them is stretch goals so that they can keep growing every time. And that's it, I think uh, it's longer than I expected, but that's basically it. Thank you so much, Felix. Actually, um, it doesn't matter that you were longer than we expected because we also have a number of questions for you. So uh, I don't know if anybody wants to shout out any live, but I'd like to start with, um, with one that we have from here from uh, Peter. He says, how do you think about generating alignment, resolving dependencies and uh, disagreements with about priority, oh gosh, let me start one more time. Uh, 
uh, or Peter, if you want to ask the question. Yeah, live. sure. I, I can ask the question. <laughs> like, thanks for the talk, Felix. Um, you know, I, I've had the good fortune to work in teams that, that have both given and, and strong ownership, and also I've given ownership out, and it really leads to high performing teams. But the sort of flip side of the coin is, you know, when you don't have that sort of centralized ownership, the boss tells you what to do, you can really kind of fall into the trap of, um, like every little team has their own little empire and they think they know what's important locally. But how do you generate that alignment? How do you get all the horses stampeding the same direction? That's exactly where I am right now in my company, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm really, really um, believe that uh, uh, collaboration and communication is the key for that. So what I mean by that is that the, the leads in each of those teams have to be to align uh, from time to time, for example, every two weeks, something like that. And not only the, the managers, also the PMs, uh, all, all the leads had to align on that so that the, they, they can basically align their roadmaps because for sure they're going to be, each team is going to have their own roadmap and their own priorities. And at some point they're going to, to have to collaborate. And if you don't anticipate that, it's going to be very complex and there's going to be a lot of conflicts. So, one of the, the things in order to do that, in my opinion, is you, you have to, the first thing is that you have to, to the leadership align on what the priorities across the whole company are. Mm, yeah. I, what, one trick Matt Zimmerman, who, who's a great engineering manager, uh, taught me is like, if you have dependencies, when you present your plan, you have to have sign off from any team that you have dependencies on before you can pitch the plan, uh, which of course then means the managers have to, that have sorted out between themselves, but at least it makes it explicit. It was still a problem yeah, for us, what, but hoping you had a silver yeah, one, bullet. One trick, one trick that, that I, I like to use normally is when I, ha I know that I have a dependency with, with a team, I try to see the dependencies of, the, of those teams and the part of their product and understanding if we have something which we can help them. Because see, there is something that you can help other teams with, it's going to be way easier. To, to, to get an agreement with them about the, how you can help them and they can help you and things like that. But don't, no, not always is like as easy as that. Great, thank you. All right, so um i have a question um before we get to luisa's more important question um okay you mentioned okr a few times and i actually had to google that uh but it came up with a few answers so i googled it and it said objective and key results peter wrote back to me and said organizational key results but i think it depends on what company you're coming from uh my understanding and what in google and here in Urban Bride, we're using these objectives and key results. And can you explain what that is for us uh, low lights who have not worked at Google? Uh, yeah, basically it's that like you have to set a goal and then the key results to, to, to obtain that goal. Okay. okay. So it's, it's, as, it's as simple as, as that. The, the complexity is in the details. Um, because what, what I mentioned before in, the, in, the, in one of the slides with this, the problem is that a lot of people think that they're, 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 is using goals the same way that they were using it before and they're using OKRs. But it's more complex because if you want to have OKRs for ownership, what it has to happen is that you have OKRs at the level of uh, the company. So that's, that those are the strategy OKRs. And then each um, layer has to cascade in those OKRs. So at some point, each team it has, it has to de, de, de define their own OKRs, okay? Let's, let's put it even more simple than that. At some point in my team, we're going to say, my objective is to, to improve what I said before about, for example, Cabify. We need to, 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 to improve, um, to reduce the price, the, the, the cost of, the, of, the, of, the, of each trip. The way, the, a key result for that, it means to reduce the route, the, the route. So every route, imagine that every time a, 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 a car, Uber or Cabify has to do a trip, maybe they're doing in average eight, seven kilometers. A, a way to reduce our cost is maybe 
go through a, an average of five kilometers. I haven't, I mean, I've never worked in Cabify or Uber, so probably this is completely uh, uh, useless and stupid, but the idea is, is that you have a, a goal and then you have to define the, the key results to, to achieve that goal. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes more sense for me. Um, and then we have one question from Anna. Um, it's, uh, Anna, I don't know if you want to say it live yourself or you want me to read it out for you. Sure, I can, I can um, ask Felix directly. So um, I, I was curious to get your thoughts on like how can you get an individual contributor? I think um, the presentation covered like how managers, we can help individuals to grow their ownership, right? But if you are an individual contributor, how can I myself train that or grow that skill set, right? To like be able to own my work. Do you have any advice for that? So to be honest, I think that in, for these things, the company that you are, it matters a lot. Be, um, because at the end, you have, in the, you have to have an environment in which they allow you to, to, to feel that. Because at the end, if you go to work and you have a box or manager or, 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 that is going to tell you, you have to do this no matter how, and it's all the time like that, I'm going to find really difficult, at least for me, to, to feel that I own something there. Um, but if you you have the right environment and still you don't you don't have the you don't feel like you have the, the the ownership of that. Again, I will say that probably you have to go to work on a company that you believe in that in that in that in what you're doing, um, and probably this is something that I only want to say in our industry in the tech industry. We we have the privilege that we can choose the company that we want to work for, um, and in at least. This is for in a personal opinion. One a big part for me of believing in the in what I do is to believe in the in the in the company, to in the the product or in the values. Um, sometimes it could be believing in someone that I know that works for that company, and I know that um, for whatever reason that person is is good. It could be uh, good at from a technical point of view or from a management point of view, but also it could be that that person. I feel that um, is good, like a human being, and I, I would like to 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 work for for him or for her. Um, but in my opinion, it's it's complex if you don't believe in something of that the company values or the people that were there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Felix. 